All right, tonight we're going to be in 1 Samuel chapter 17. 1 Samuel chapter 17, the, the tentative game plan is we're going to spend three weeks in chapter 17 addressing the, the famous story of David and Goliath. And so we start tonight by uh, David uh, doesn't come on the scene uh, to be the main character in these verses, but he will in 17, and he, he is, uh, he's, he's a part of it. But Goliath and Saul and the army of Israel are basically the main characters for mo- most of the text tonight. What we're going to do is I'm going to read each and every one of the 16 verses as we get to it, okay? So I won't read the entire text at the start, but no, I will be getting to it. As chapter 17 starts, it, it, there's a big transition from chapter 16. The end of chapter 16, uh, David is going to play the harp for King Saul. When he plays the harp, the evil spirit departs from Saul. And so Saul sends to Jesse saying, I want your son around me. But now in chapter 17, David's back home and shepherding the sheep. And now Israel has entered into battle. Uh, I say they've entered into battle. The Philistines have come onto the land, so now the army of Israel has been rallied, and Saul is leading them. So Saul is is not at his residence, is is our understanding here. Uh, And this is where we're introduced to the giant named Goliath. And so in this text, we're going to see a big bully. Um, But before we see the big bully, let's take a look at the first three verses. And the outline's on the back of your sheet there. I will let you know that it's on purpose that some of the gaps are larger than others, okay? It doesn't look uniform on the page, but that's on purpose because I think if you take notes, you're going to have more notes in that area, okay? Some of these I'll go quickly through, and then some areas will take longer of our time, and so I've provided a little more space in those areas. So number one, the preparation for battle. And the title of the message is what to do when Goliath comes looking for you. And now number one, the preparation for battle in the first three verses. So in verse one, we see that the Philistines gathered on Israel's land. Look there with me. Now the Philistines gathered their armies for battle. And they were gathered at Soko, which belongs to Judah. And they camped between Soko and Azekah in Ephes Damon. So the Philistines camped on Judah's land. Now, who is Judah? All right, so let me give you a history lesson here. Jacob, you got Abraham, then uh, son was Isaac. Isaac's son was Jacob and Esau, so Jacob. And then Jacob had the 12 sons, and the descendants of those 12 sons are called the 12 tribes of Israel. Okay, so one of them was Judah. And so the descendants of Judah is the tribe of Judah. Well, Judah also had land. Okay, and so this is now... Uh, where Jerusalem is, where Bethlehem is, that's in the land of Judah. Well, uh, so you know, David is a descendant of Judah. The Lord Jesus later on becomes a descendant of Judah. Okay, so now we got Judah uh, around Jerusalem, Bethlehem area. Uh, David's back at Bethlehem, near Bethlehem, um, shepherding the sheep back home. And here the Philistines come on the land in the land of Judah. So in short, they're coming on Israel's land. And so what do you do when someone comes and, and uh, comes to take over your land right there on your, your property? Well, you're going to do one of two things if people come on your property to take over it. You're either going to give in or you're going to fight back. Those are the two options. So Saul has rallied the army of Israel to fight back, to push the Philistines back off the land. And so that's what's presented in verse 1. Let's go to number 2 now. The Israelites gathered to defend their land. Verse 2. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered and camped in the valley of Elah and drew up in battle array to encounter the Philistines. So Israel here responds like any sovereign nation would. This is our land. You come on our land. You can't be here. And so they come out to to fight to push them back. The valley of Elah is only about two to three miles from Jerusalem. Okay, so if I had a map, um, here's Jerusalem in southeast. About six miles is Bethlehem. The Valley of Elah is somewhere south of Jerusalem, so it would be west of Bethlehem, all right? Very small area, 
All right? I mean, it's from Jerusalem to Bethlehem is driving from Millington to Munford. Okay? I mean, that's, it's that close. Okay? And now below Jerusalem, we see the Valley of Elah is there, and that's where the, the men of Israel have gathered for this battle. Now, number three, third subpoint, the valley separated the two groups. Verse three, the Philistines stood on the mountain on one side while Israel stood on the mountain on the other side with the valley between them. So we got, we got two massive armies and down below is this valley, all right? So they can see each other, they can hear each other if they yell, um, and they're ready to engage, all right? You need to know that David is not there, all right? You know David's going to end up there if you've heard of David and Goliath, but he is not, he's not there as part of the army at this time, all right? Brings us to major point number two now. Goliath described. He is, Goliath is described in verses four through seven. First, we see his title in verse four. Then a champion came out from the armies of the Philistines named Goliath. Now, why does he have the title of being a champion? It's not hard to figure out. It's because he can kick tail and take names. All right? Many men have died because they fought him. He lived and they didn't. Uh, he is a champion because he has won all of these battles. They might be battles army against army, but they also are battles one man against another. And he has won time and time again. Second, we see his size. Verse 4, second part says, Goliath from Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. Uh, you know this already, but Goliath was huge. All right? He, we don't know what an exact cubit is, but I'm going to give you what everyone speculates. It's from, your, it's from right here at the inner part of your elbow all the way to your wrist. And typically they say that's 17 and a half to 18 inches. Some measure it longer to 20 inches, okay? Obviously, not everyone's forearm's the same length. And so, you know, to measure it that way, you're going to be inconsistent a little bit. But it says here that he had the height of six cubits, so six times 18 inches, roughly, and then a span is half of that. They would measure a span by taking four fingers and putting them together and doing that three times, basically, you know, and that space was a span, okay? And that's supposed to be half a cubit. So you've got 18 inches times six, and then you've got nine more. It ends up being about nine feet, nine inches tall. That would be the shortest. If he's 20 inches every cubit instead of 17 and a half to 18, then he is 12 feet tall, and some speculate even 13 feet tall. Now, the ceiling in here is 10 feet. 10 feet. Uh-oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah. Everyone start praying. This, this is up here. And this is what David was looking at. I'm at 9 feet 9 inches right now. And this is the shortest he would have been. Obviously, he's broad, thick, big. So, I mean, you know, the bottom of the ladder, picture him taking up that space all the way up. It'd be a picture of Goliath. And again, he might have been taller than that. Everyone's praying. Okay, I, I made it down. Made it down. All right. Y'all were wondering why the ladder's there. Now you know, all right. Um, giants are mentioned throughout the Bible numerous times if you don't know that. Okay, so I'm going to give you some of those texts of Scripture. Um, if you go to Numbers 13, verse 33, verse will be on the screen for you, but if you want to write a reference down to look up later as well, Numbers 13, 33, there also we saw the Nephilim. And Nephilim means giants. The sons of Anak are part of the Nephilim. And we became like grasshoppers in our own sight. And so we were in their sight. So Israel was saying we're like grasshoppers. Basically, they're referencing we were so small compared to them. That's the point of that. All right. That's in numbers. Okay. So that would be 400 
uh, or so years prior to the time of Saul and David. Uh, to give an idea of the size of these giants, we got Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 11. For only Og, king of Bashan, was left of the remnant of Rephaim. Behold, his bedstead was an iron bedstead, and it is in Rabbah, the sons of Ammon. Its length was nine cubits, and its width four cubits by ordinary cubit. Well, nine cubits by four cubits means it was, this bed was 13 and a half feet long and six feet wide. Now, why do you need a bed 13 and a half feet long if you're only seven feet long? You don't. You need a bed 13 and a half feet because you're about 12, 12 and a half yourself. Okay? And so, very big man. Um, if, uh, I think there's a few inches on a queen size bed in the width, but in general terms, a queen size bed is five feet wide, and yet this one man's bed was six feet wide by himself and 13 and a half feet long. Big guy. Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 2 and 3. It says, a people great and tall, the sons of Anakim, whom you know and of whom you have heard it said, who can stand before the sons of Anak? Because the descendants of Anak, the sons of Anak, were so big, they were all giants, that no one thought they could keep up with them. Then verse 3 of that text says, Know therefore today that it is the Lord your God who is crossing over before you as a consuming fire. He will destroy them. So this is Israel kind of being scared to take the promised land. He says, he's, the Lord's going to cross over and he's going to destroy them and he will subdue them before you, excuse me, so that you may drive them out and destroy them quickly just as the Lord has spoken to you. So Israel looked at the size of them and said, no way. But the Lord gave the promise that he would take care of them. Later in Joshua, after they took the land, Joshua eleven twenty two 22 says, There were no Anakim left in the land of the sons of Israel. Why? Because the Lord said He would take them out, and He took most of them out. In the land of Israel, there were no more. It says, Only in Gaza, specifically in Gath and in Ashdod, some remained. Where is Goliath from? Gath. So one of the places where the giants continue to exist, jump ahead, say, 400 years, and boom, we got Goliath being named as one from that location. And so he's from a long line of descendants. It doesn't say in this text that he's one of the Anakim. It doesn't say that. But let's just be honest. Giants weren't just hanging around in 20 different towns, okay? They were, they were in the locations mentioned here, Ashdod and Gath, and Goliath is from Gath. And so I take it that he's one of the descendants of the giants that have been there for centuries. So the physical stature of Goliath was somewhere 9 feet 9 inches to over 12 feet tall, a massive man, and he comes out before the army of Israel, and he is eager to fight anyone that they'll send out to fight him. So third, let's talk about his armor, verses 5 and 6. He had a bronze helmet on his head, and he was clothed with scale armor, which weighed 5,000 shekels of bronze. He also had bronze creaves on his legs. So he was covered from head to foot predominantly everywhere with some protective material, some protective metal. First, he had the bronze helmet on. Second, he wore the scale armor of bronze, which they say 5,000 shekels is 126 pounds. So he's wearing 126. Most of us, if we had to carry 126 pounds, we'd be wanting to get it off of us. He's actually wearing it on purpose as armor. Uh, one scholar even said when you put all the other things, the helmet with the armor, with the, the sheaves on his shins and things, one guy thinks it's 272 pounds. Now, I don't know how he got that, but that's what he's thinking. But we know here the scale armor being 5,000 shekels is 126 or so pounds. Third, we see that there were bronze greaves on his legs. Those were basically shin protectors, okay, um, of bronze that he was wearing. And so his, his appearance was very intimidating. All right, he's got, he's got the bronze helmet, he's got all the armor, he's got the sheaves covering his shins, and he's just a massive man. Four, his weapons. 
Verse 6, second part, and a bronze javelin slung between his shoulders. The shaft of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and the head of his spear weighed 600 shekels of iron. His shield carrier also walked before him. So first, Goliath had a bronze javelin. Um, scholars believe that this javelin was more of a curved sword. Now, I'll just tell you, I'm just telling you what I read. I don't know what to make out of it more than it says javelin. But it says javelin was behind him between his shoulder blades because it says it back here, slung between his shoulders was the javelin. So they, so most scholars are saying that this javelin was more of a curved sword of some sort. Second, he had a spear like a weaver's beam. And the reference to weaver's beam is not specifically known. Perhaps it refers to the weight of the spear. But we know the head of the spear had an iron point, listen to this, that weighed 15.1 pounds. That's not, what, that's not what he's throwing as a spear. That's the end point of it is 15.1 pounds, which is 600 shekels of iron. In addition to his armor, Goliath had a shield bearer. He often gets left out of the story um, as Goliath goes down and stuff. But the shield bearer would walk before him carrying a huge shield. There were two types of shield in those days. There was the round one that you kind of keep on your forearm. And then there were the big rectangle ones where oftentimes you would see in battle people get behind them as all the arrows are coming in and if you put them next to each other on top, it would be a complete barrier. So most, think that, most scholars think the size of Goliath, surely it's the bigger one. But we, we simply don't know, but the bigger one does make um, more sense because Goliath was so big. That little, that little round one ain't going to do much when you're, you know. So I, I tend to think it's the bigger one too. So... The Bible shares all this information about Goliath, his size, what he's wearing, his strength. It's going to go into his intimidation through words as well. Yet we need to be reminded of what we've already been taught back in chapter 16, verse 7, where it says this, The Lord said to Samuel, Do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, talking about who would be anointed king in that text, because I've rejected him. For God sees not as man sees. But a man looks at the outward appearance, which is what the army of Israel is doing with Goliath, but the Lord looks at the heart. And that's going to make a huge difference when David gets on the scene, as you know, to challenge Goliath. Please realize you've got some obstacles in your life. You might be looking at them with your human eyes and saying, There's, I just don't see how this is going to work. I don't see how this is going to end. God sees what you don't see, and God's able to do what you are not able to do. And when he gets to a sea, he's able to part it. And when you're in a lion's den, he's able to deliver you. When you're in a fiery furnace, he's able to deliver you. He is able to do what we are not able to do. So don't just look at outward appearance or, the, or your circumstances and be overwhelmed. Realize that God who is in you, greater is he that's in you than he that's in the world. Number three now, Goliath presents a challenge. So we've talked about the preparation for battle. Goliath is described, and now he presents a challenge. Goliath was not just intimidating in his physical appearance. He was also intimidating in his speech. First, he shouted with arrogance in verse 8. He stood and shouted to the ranks of Israel and said to them, Why do you come out to draw up in battle array? Am I not the Philistine and you servants of Saul? So you got Israel, you got the Philistines, you got the valley between. Goliath steps out front where all of Israel can see him. And they're saying, okay, he's pretty big. Okay. In fact, he's not pretty big. He's very big. And uh, he looks pretty angry right now. And he then proceeds to mock them. Why are you out here? Am I not one of the Philistines you came out to fight? Here I am. Are you not in the army of Saul following his lead? Who's going to come out and fight me? He's mocking them. What are you here to do? 
If you're just going to stand there, go back home. He's, he's making fun of them. Second, he dictated a, the fight. Verse 8, second part. Choose a man. Here's what he says to him: Choose a man for yourselves and let him come down to me. So here we at least know that Saul has gone down some out from the army because he's, he's calling him down to meet him in the valley between the two armies. He says, uh, Choose for yourself who will come down to me. If he is able to fight with me and kill me, then we will become your servants. But if I prevail against him and kill him, then you shall become our servants and serve us. I will tell you, there is a positive to one-on-one combat in these situations. Not everyone on the defeated side has to die, you know? All right, one-on-one, one of them's going to win, one's going to lose, one's going to live, one's going to die, but the rest of us, we might become their slaves, but at least we're living, okay? And we don't got to risk our lives. But the downfall to it is, is you're placing everything about your future livelihood on one person. And they took a look at Goliath, and they didn't think they had anyone that was going to win. Another negative is you make this agreement that, hey, if you, as, De, as Goliath said, if one of y'all kill me, then, then we'll serve you. Well, that happens, as you know. And then the Phil, Philistine army, they run. So one of the downsides to one-on-one battles here is that people don't keep their word. And the army of the Philistines just took off running, and, and we'll get to it, but the army of Israel all of a sudden gets very confident and emboldened after David wins, and they go after them, and they take them out. But they're not at that place of confidence at this moment. Third, I want you to see he mocked with disrespect. Verse 10, again, the Philistine said, I defy the ranks of Israel this day. Give me a man that will fight, that we may fight together. And so in other words, you know, some people say things that, and they're, they're being subtle about it. He's not. He's standing out here, I defy you. I'm provoking you. I'm ready to fight. Will any coward step out and take me on? You bunch of wimps, you know. I mean, he is mocking them, intimidating them, degrading them in the strongest way. Way well, can. For his words brought fear. Verse 11. When Saul and all Israel heard these words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Now, I don't know if y'all recall, but Saul, the king, he will later, he'll say, Saul has killed his thousands and David is ten thousand. Saul is a great warrior. I mean, he's going to go on to be praised for killing thousands of people in battle. The man can fight, and he is, a, he is, everyone else only makes it up to his shoulders. He's a head taller than everyone else in Israel. So let's just say he's seven feet tall. I mean, he's tall, but not next to Goliath. Uh, he, you know, he's very small compared to him. And so here is Saul, the king, a great warrior. He's one of the biggest men among them, maybe the biggest, and yet he's not accepting the challenge, nor is he choosing one of his best to go out and fight this giant. All of Israel is dismayed and greatly afraid. Greatly afraid. Now, let's remember some truths about Saul here. In the previous text in chapter 16, the spirit that had come upon him when he got anointed to be king departed from him because God is now blessing David as the future king and not Saul anymore. So God removed his spirit. God the spirit removed himself from being with Saul. So Saul is now on the battlefield and he has no anointing. He has no favor. He, has, he does not have the blessing of the Lord with him, the spirit of the Lord with him. He is powerless at this time, and we see him lack great faith. Back in 1 Samuel 11, he had already led Israel to go against the Ammonites when the Ammonites came on the land. And you know what Israel did to the Ammonites? They whooped them. And, but Saul had the Spirit of the Lord with him then. He does not have the Spirit of the Lord with him any longer. Now, as we study, before we move on, as we study this, I want you to realize that the physical man, Goliath, provides us a spiritual picture of the obstacles in your life and mine. 
The army of Israel was ready to defend their land until they saw the Goliath. They thought they could beat the Philistines until they saw Goliath. Many times we talk about how great God is and how God's going to take care of us until we see our Goliath. And then poor pitiful me, and God's not able. But now we might not say it out loud, but that's how we're, that's how we're living. But God is able. 2 Timothy 1.7, God has not given us a spirit of timidity or fear, but of power and love and discipline. Whatever you're going through, whatever your Goliath is, that's overwhelming you. It might be your health. It might be a relationship. It might be finances. It might be um, a rebellious child or grandchild. It might be a, a relationship you want to have reconciled, but you can't do it because the other part, whatever the case, whatever your Goliath is, you need to be praying with hope. Because God is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that we could ask or think. Also, Goliath doesn't just represent figuratively the obstacles in our lives and the challenges, but he is a picture of the devil as well. What is he doing here in this text to the army of Israel? He's provoking them. He's tempting them. He's degrading them. He's letting them know, hey, you've got no chance of beating me. And that's what the devil does in our lives. He tries to tempt us, degrade us, remove our faith, remove our courage, remove our confidence to tell us that we are not good to accomplish anything. So what do we need to do in response to the lies of the devil? Put on the full armor of God. Ephesians 6 I want to read it, verses 11 through 17. And by the way, Sunday mornings, we're going to get to it soon, okay? All right? We're at chapter 6, verse 1, starting Sunday, so we're going to get to it soon. Verse 11 says, Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood. Please remember that. Is there someone you're angry with, you're frustrated with, you're so disappointed in? Your battle is not against flesh and blood. It's against the principalities of darkness. All right? It's against the rulers, against the powers, against the world forces of this darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the full armor of God so that you will be able to resist in the evil day, having done everything to stand firm. Stand firm. Therefore, having girded your loins with truth, having put on the breastplate of righteousness, having shod your feet with the preparation of the gospel of peace. In addition to all, taking up the shield of faith with which you will be able to extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. What arrows is the devil shooting at you? May you have that shield of faith that stops them. And then it says, verse 17, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Okay? And so, how do we stand firm? We stay true to the Word of God. We saturate our minds with the Word of God. We put on the full armor of God, who will never leave you or forsake you. Number four, the family of David. Look with me in verses 12 through 15. Now David was the son of the Aphrodite of Bethlehem in Judah, whose name was Jesse. And he had eight sons. And Jesse was old in the days of Saul, advanced in years among men. The three older sons of Jesse had gone after Saul to the battle. And the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and the second to him, Abinadab, and the third, Shammah. David was the youngest. Now the three oldest followed Saul, but David went back and forth from Saul to tend to his father's flock at Bethlehem. So Saul calls for the army of Israel to rally to the valley of Elah to engage in battle with the Philistines, and the three oldest went. Okay, now I'm not too united on my sources on what they really present, but some of them certainly present that you enter the army of Israel at age 20. Okay, now you might read 18 or something else, all right? But what I read was 20. 
Um, only three of them were there in the army. So I believe I'm taking this that son four, five, six, seven, and eight are not yet of age to be there on the battlefield. And David being eight, he, he might be 12 or 13 at this time very easily. Y'all with me? Now the scripture doesn't say how old he is. I'm just trying to put numbers together for you. It is speculation, but he, he is young. He's not, he's not close to of age if, if the oldest three are the only three of age to be on the battlefield. Now, number five, the repeated challenge of Goliath. Verse 16, the Philistine came forward morning and evening for 40 days and took his stand. You know, I don't understand, I don't understand some things about battle and warfare. I mean, I'm not going to have my army out there for 40 days to listen to a man give that invitation 80 times, and yet we're still standing there. I mean, either be in or be all out. I mean, do one or the other. But Saul's just standing there, and the boy's there. They're just standing there. The three oldest brothers of David are there, and no one's willing to challenge him. He comes out each morning. Will someone please, I'm trying to provoke you and get you angry. Will someone please come fight? Then he comes out each evening and says the same thing for 40 straight days. I'm trying to figure out what Saul was waiting on. But we know with God's providence, and we know the end of the story, that, he's, that truly God's using all this to get David to the battle line to engage the giant. What do we learn from this Philistine Goliath each morning, each evening, coming out and saying, will someone come on out and challenge me? The earlier verses, we hear him taunting them, provoking them to anger, uh, to respond. What do we learn about Goliath? He wasn't lacking in pride. That's what I infer from this. This is a man that is completely not only confident but arrogant. He's prideful. Who is he representing according to what I said a moment ago? The devil? I think he's pretty prideful. Isn't that why he fell? Pride. And here Goliath is, is picturing pride. And James 4, 6 says, God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Goliath, as we know, is going to be humble. There was a, a minister, a Boy Scout, a computer expert, um, and they were, they were the passenger, only passengers on this small plane with this pilot, so four of them. And the pilot had to come back in the cabin and said, look, the plane's going down. We only have three parachutes. There's four of us. Look, I've got a wife. I've got kids. I think I ought to have one of the parachutes. He puts it on. He jumps. And now the pilot is no longer on the plane. You got this computer expert. You got a minister and you got a Boy Scout. And the computer whiz said, I should have one of the parachutes because I'm one of the smartest men in the world and the world needs me. And so he took one and he jumped. So now you've got the, the Boy Scout and the minister. The minister turned to the Boy Scout with a sad smile and said, you're a young man. I've lived a, a great life. You've got a long life ahead of you. You take the parachute and I'll go down with the plane. And the Boy Scout said, oh, relax, sir, relax. The smartest man in the world just jumped out of the plane with my knapsack. <laughs> God opposes the proud. What'd that, what'd that computer will say? The world needed me. God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God and He will exalt you at the proper time. So in summary, be humble, not fearful. The Lord has not given you a spirit of timidity, of fear. The only way to overcome fear, if you have it, look to Jesus. Trust, hope, believe. Because he is able to do far more abundantly beyond all that you ask or think, according to the power that works within us. Can we claim that promise? Whatever Goliath you have, take it to the Lord. 
and believe that He's going to conquer that giant in your life. If you'll bow your heads and close your eyes with me, please. Lord God, we we love You and we thank You for the truths You've presented to us from this text of Scripture. And as we continue to journey through this, this story of David and Goliath, continue to teach us. And I pray everyone tonight would leave here laying down their Goliaths at Your feet for You to take them and deal with them. And I pray, Lord God, You would let every person take responsibility for whatever they need to do in action to make things right for for the Goliath to be behind them. But I pray, Lord, if it's a health issue, You would help them to believe and have faith that You would comfort them in their time of need. If it's a relationship issue, I pray that You would lead them to take responsibility for what they've caused in the conflict. And I pray You would bring reconciliation between people. I pray for, for marriages that need reconciliation, you'd bring that in the marriages. I pray, Lord God, for people dealing with financial strife. I pray, Lord God, you would help them to be diligent and good stewards of the resources you've given them. I pray that you would resolve their issues, that you would take care of their financial challenges. Lord, we trust you. We ask that you do a work in each of our lives and shine through us and use us for your glory to grow your kingdom. I pray this all in the name of Jesus. Amen.